This is the University of Cambridge Local Examination Syndicate International General Certificate of Secondary Education, May 2003 Examination in English as a Second Language. Paper 4, Listening Comprehension. Welcome to the exam. In a moment, your teacher is going to give out the question papers. When you get your paper, fill in your name, center number, and candidate number on the front page. Do not talk to anyone during the test. If you would like the tape to be louder, tell your teacher now. The tape will not be stopped while you are doing the test. Teacher, please give out the question papers, and when all the candidates are ready to start the test, please turn the tape back on. Now you are all ready, here is the test. Look at the questions for part one. There are six questions in this part of the exam. You will hear each question twice. For each question, you will hear the situation described as it is on your exam paper. Part 1. Questions 1 to 6. For questions 1 to 6, you will hear a series of short sentences. Answer each question on the line provided. Your answer should be as brief as possible. You will hear each item twice. Question 1. Dinesh is in his local supermarket. Where exactly is the olive oil to be found? Give two details. Excuse me, where is the olive oil, please? It's in row 16, next to the tins of tomatoes. Excuse me, where is the olive oil, please? It's in row 16, next to the tins of tomatoes. Question 2. Will is at the petrol station. How much is the fuel bill, and what else is he looking for? Pump number 10, please. That's £20.50, please. Thank you. Do you sell newspapers? Yes, over there next to the map books. Pump number 10, please. That's £20.50, please. Thank you. Do you sell newspapers? Yes, over there next to the map books. Question 3. Give two details about where in the book you will find your chemistry homework exercises. For your chemistry homework, please complete the ten questions in the exercise at the end of Chapter 12. You will find them on page 145. For your chemistry homework, Please complete the ten questions in the exercise at the end of Chapter 12. You will find them on page 145. Question 4. It is break time on Patel's first day at college. Where may he purchase a drink? Name two places. Can you tell me where I could buy a drink, please? There's a snack bar on the first floor next to the lift. Hot drinks are sold there. Otherwise, there's a drinks machine next to the gym which sells Coke or lemonade. That might be quicker. Can you tell me where I could buy a drink, please? There's a snack bar on the first floor next to the lift. Hot drinks are sold there. Otherwise, there's a drinks machine next to the gym which sells Coke or lemonade. That might be quicker. Question 5. 
list two ways in which the weather will change. The weather tomorrow will be dry and cool with maximum daytime temperature of 9 degrees. The outlook for the rest of the week is becoming warmer, brighter and clearer with daytime temperatures rising to 14 degrees. The weather tomorrow will be dry and cool with maximum daytime temperature of 9 degrees. The outlook for the rest of the week is becoming warmer, brighter and clearer with daytime temperatures rising to 14 degrees. Question 6. Which two instruments are needed to complete the college orchestra? We need musicians for the college orchestra. We have enough flutes and clarinets, but still need more trumpets and a reliable piano player. We need musicians for the college orchestra. We have enough flutes and clarinets, but still need more trumpets and a reliable piano player. That is the last question in part one. In a moment, you will hear part two. Now look at the questions for part two, exercise one. Part 2. Part 2, Exercise 1. Question 7. Listen to the following interview about a young instrumentalist. Then complete the notes below. You will hear the interview twice. Good evening, and welcome to Music Line. Tonight we will listen to the world premiere of a new opera, we will hear excerpts from Schubert's songs, and in the studio we are going to speak to a promising young violinist, 16-year-old Kara Araf, is here with us now. Hello. Kara, you are just 16, and already you are playing solo violin with some of the world's greatest orchestras and ensembles. Yes, that's right. How have you achieved so much at such a young age? You must have practiced continually. Yes. For the last ten years, I've been commuting between Germany, Italy and Spain in order to study violin effectively. How have you coped with all the travel and the constant upheaval? Surely you have missed out on your childhood and your education. Oh, no. Travel has given me a mature approach towards life. It is an education in itself to appreciate other cultures, and I have already got some qualifications. I have A-levels in German, Spanish and music. I would only be beginning to study for those now if I'd stayed at home. OK. When did you begin playing violin? When I was two. Two years old? Really? I had a tiny violin, because otherwise I kept annoying my brothers and sisters when they practised their instruments. <laughs> what sort of music do you play? Classical only. I think classical music should be played as the composer wrote it, not in some kind of arrangement with a modern backing. I don't want to become one of those pop classical performers. But that would be more popular with audiences, wouldn't it? Well, maybe, but I want my audience to know that I am just like them and that this good classical music is for them to enjoy too. This is what I play. Isn't it great? Hmm. What are your plans now? I'm just about to release my first album, a collection of 12 of my favourite pieces. I hope it will bring joy to many listeners. What advice would you give to budding musicians who may be listening? That is easy. Work hard and keep practicing. Never give up. Take every opportunity you can to play your instrument, whether at home or school or in the concert hall. Experience counts, and every performance brings pleasure to your audience. Kara, we are looking forward to your playing echoing through our homes for a long time to come. Thank you very much for talking to us.
Now you will hear the interview again. Good evening, and welcome to Music Line. Tonight we will listen to the world premiere of a new opera. We will hear excerpts from Schubert's songs, and in the studio we are going to speak to a promising young violinist. Sixteen-year-old Kara Araf is here with us now. Hello, Kara. You are just sixteen, and already you are playing solo violin with some of the world's greatest orchestras and ensembles. Yes, that's right. How have you achieved so much at such a young age? You must have practiced continually. Yes. For the last ten years, I have been commuting between Germany, Italy, and Spain in order to study violin effectively. How have you coped with all the travel and the constant upheaval? Surely you have missed out on your childhood and your education. Oh no! Travel has given me a mature approach towards life. It is an education in itself to appreciate other cultures, and I have already got some qualifications. I have A levels in German, Spanish, and music. I would only be beginning to study for those now if I'd stayed at home. Okay. When did you begin playing violin? When I was two. Two years old, really? I had a tiny violin because otherwise I kept annoying my brothers and sisters when they practiced their instruments. <laughs> What sort of music do you play? Classical only. I think classical music should be played as the composer wrote it. Not in some kind of arrangement with a modern backing. I don't want to become one of those pop classical performers. But that would be more popular with audiences, wouldn't it? Well, maybe, but I want my audience to know that I am just like them, and that this good classical music is for them to enjoy too. This is what I play. Isn't it great? <laughs> what are your plans now? I'm just about to release my first album, a collection of twelve of my favourite pieces. I hope it will bring joy to many listeners. What advice would you give to budding musicians who may be listening? That is easy. Work hard and keep practicing. Never give up. Take every opportunity you can to play your instrument, whether at home or school or in the concert hall. Experience counts, and every performance brings pleasure to your audience. Kara, we are looking forward to your playing echoing through our homes for a long time to come. Thank you very much for talking to us. That is the end of part two, exercise one. In a moment, you will hear part two, exercise two. Now look at the questions for exercise two. Part two, exercise two, question eight. Listen to the following interview about the perfume making industry, and then complete the notes below. You will hear the interview twice. Have you ever wondered how perfume is made and why it is so expensive? Today I am in Grasse in the south of France, at a centuries-old perfume factory. Where I am going to find out more about the perfume making industry, Monsieur Fragonard, could you tell us, please, how and why the perfume industry grew up in Grasse? Certainly, Grasse is a medieval town, and for many hundreds of years it has been a source of the extremely expensive waxy extract from flowers, which provides the basis of expensive perfumes. But why has the industry here become so successful? Well, our sense of smell allows us to bring alive memories and images more than any other sense. A certain perfume will remind us, for example, of an occasion, whether it was our first date or 
Maybe it was what our friend was wearing in the examination room. That is why perfume is so important. Anyway, to answer your question, Grass didn't start out as a perfume making center. What do you mean? Until the 16th century, Grass was a famous glove making town. Then some of the noblemen complained about the smell of the leather in the gloves which they had bought. They wanted them scented with flowers from Provence.、Uh, that is the region in which our town is situated, famous for its fragrant fields and hedgerows. So that was how it started: scented gloves. That's right. Perfume making in the 16th century was very labor-intensive. That is, it was hard work. First, flowers had to be boiled in copper vats, or by another method, the blossoms and blooms had to be rubbed into fat, which slowly absorbed the scent. Then everything had to be washed with alcohol to separate the perfume from the fats. Is the process very different nowadays? Oh yes, just look at our factory. It was actually designed by Gustav Eiffel in 1890. Do you mean the same Monsieur Eiffel who designed the Eiffel Tower in Paris? Absolutely. Anyway, today we extract the scent from flowers using chemicals. It sounds easy. Yes, but still a long process. We gather flowers from the fields around our town, high up in the hills at dawn. The flowers, mainly jasmine, violets, and roses, must still have dew on them. One metric ton of blooms, ten million flowers, produces three kilograms of perfume essence, and one kilogram costs fifteen thousand euros. Are you the only factory producing perfume in the area? No, there are forty perfume houses, as we like to call ourselves, but the public may only visit three of them. I'd like to make a new perfume. You can. Come and visit us, and for twenty-five euros, we'll help you create a fragrance and keep its recipe as a secret for your use only. Monsieur Fragonard, many thanks. Now you will hear the interview again. Have you ever wondered how perfume is made, and why it is so expensive? Today I am in Grass in the south of France, at a centuries-old perfume factory, where I am going to find out more about the perfume-making industry. Monsieur Fragonard, could you tell us, please, how and why the perfume industry grew up in Grass? Certainly. Grass is a medieval town, and for many hundreds of years, it has been a source of the extremely expensive waxy extract from flowers, which provides the basis of expensive perfumes. But why has the industry here become so successful? Well, our sense of smell allows us to bring alive memories and images more than any other sense. A certain perfume will remind us, for example, of an occasion, whether it was our first date or. Maybe it was what our friend was wearing in the examination room. That is why perfume is so important. Anyway, to answer your question, Grass didn't start out as a perfume making center. What do you mean? Until the 16th century, Grass was a famous glove making town. Then some of the noblemen complained about the smell of the leather in the gloves which they had bought. They wanted them scented with flowers from Provence.、Uh, that is the region in which our town is situated. Famous for its fragrant fields and hedgerows. So that was how it started: scented gloves. That's right. Perfume making in the 16th century was very labor-intensive. That is, it was hard work. First, flowers had to be boiled in copper vats, or by another method, the blossoms and blooms had to be rubbed into fat, which slowly absorbed the scent. Then everything had to be washed with alcohol to separate the perfume from the fats. Is the process very different nowadays? Oh yes, just look at our factory. It was actually designed by Gustav Eiffel in 1890. Do you mean the same Monsieur Eiffel who designed the Eiffel Tower in Paris? Absolutely. Anyway, today we extract the scent from flowers using chemicals. It sounds easy. Yes, but still a long process. We gather flowers from the fields around our town, high up in the hills at dawn. 
the flowers, mainly jasmine, violets and roses, must still have dew on them. One metric tonne of blooms, 10 million flowers, produces 3 kilograms of perfume essence, and 1 kilogram costs 15,000 euros. Are you the only factory producing perfume in the area? No, there are 40 perfume houses, as we like to call ourselves, but the public may only visit three of them. I'd like to make a new perfume. You can. Come and visit us, and for 25 euros, we'll help you create a fragrance and keep its recipe as a secret for your use only. Monsieur Fragonard, many thanks. That is the end of part two. In a moment, you will hear part three. Now look at the questions for part three, exercise one. Part 3. Part 3, Exercise 1. Question 9. Listen to the following interview about whale watching and then answer the questions below. You will hear the interview twice. South Africa is famous for its big animals, the elephant, buffalo, rhino, lion and leopard. But what about its largest mammals, its whales? Today, we are going to meet Wilson Schmidt, the world's only professional whale crier in the old South African fishing village of Hermanus. Wilson, tell us about your job. I'm called a whale crier because I play fanfares on this horn to alert tourists to sightings of whales. These billboards which I'm wearing provide maps of where whales are to be found and how many are likely to be there. I also find the best viewing points for whale-watching audiences. Can we only watch whales from your town, then? Oh, no. Hermanus is at the heart of the 1,500-kilometre-long whale route. We call this the Whale Coast. You can watch whales from any headland cliff or golden cove. All year round? Mainly between June and December. You see, the whales come from their Antarctic feeding grounds to give birth and to nurture their young. Our sheltered bays give them refuge and warmth. Do many whales come? Well, they have been a protected species since 1935, and as a result, their numbers have increased by 7% each year. They have been coming to our shores for hundreds of years, of course, but the tourist industry has only just realised this and has begun to organise whale-watching as an activity. Don't the spectators upset the whales? Yes, they would do, but we have a 300-metre standoff policy for ships and aircraft, otherwise we might drive the whales away. After all, there is a special relationship between them and our country. They are born here. How might people react if a boat did stray too near? These huge mammals are very friendly and inquisitive. Some would follow a boat and nudge it, for example. <laughs> Do lots of types of whales come to your waters? Mainly the type called the southern right. Its weight is equal to about ten elephants, and it can be recognised by the bumps on its head. Sometimes humpback whales come singing as they swim, and... Bride's whales are found further offshore all year round. Recently, we've even seen one of the rare beaked whales. How do you know they're there? In the daytime, we can see them. But at night, people who live here say they are kept awake by the noise of whales splashing in and out of the water. Spectators rush to the coast at the beginning of the season, eager to see or hear the first whale. We even have a whale website, which keeps you up to date with sightings. It is www.whalewatching.com. Wilson, very many thanks.
Now you will hear the interview again. South Africa is famous for its big animals: the elephant, buffalo, rhino, lion, and leopard. But what about its largest mammals, its whales? Today we are going to meet Wilson Schmidt, the world's only professional whale crier in the old South African fishing village of Hermanus. Wilson, tell us about your job. I'm called a whale crier because I play fanfares on this horn to alert tourists to sightings of whales. These billboards, which I'm wearing, provide maps of where whales are to be found and how many are likely to be there. I also find the best viewing points for whale watching audiences. Can we only watch whales from your town then? Oh no, Hermanus is at the heart of the 1,500 kilometer long whale route. We call this the Whale Coast. You can watch whales from any headland cliff or Golden Cove all year round. Mainly between June and December. You see, the whales come from their Antarctic feeding grounds to give birth and to nurture their young. Our sheltered bays give them refuge and warmth. Do many whales come? Well, they have been a protected species since 1935, and as a result, their numbers have increased by seven percent each year. They have been coming to our shores for hundreds of years, of course. But the tourist industry has only just realised this and has begun to organise whale watching as an activity. Don't the spectators upset the whales? Yes, they would do. But we have a 300 metre standoff policy for ships and aircraft. Otherwise, we might drive the whales away. After all, there is a special relationship between them and our country. They are born here. How might a whale react if a boat did stray too near? These huge mammals are very friendly and inquisitive. Some would follow a boat and nudge it, for example. Do lots of types of whales come to your waters? Mainly the type called the southern right. Its weight is equal to about ten elephants, and it can be recognised by the bumps on its head. Sometimes humpback whales come singing as they swim, and bride's whales are found further offshore all year round. Recently, we've even seen one of the rare beaked whales. How do you know they're there? In the daytime we can see them, but at night people who live here say they are kept awake by the noise of whales splashing in and out of the water. Spectators rush to the coast at the beginning of the season, eager to see or hear the first whale. We even have a whale website which keeps you up to date with sightings. It is www.whalewatching.com. Wilson, very many thanks. That is the end of part three, exercise one. In a moment, you will hear exercise two. Now look at the questions for exercise two. Part three, exercise two, question ten. Listen to the following interview about some new planes called Baby Concorde that will fly beyond the sound barrier quietly. Then answer the questions below. You will hear the interview twice. Today I am talking to John Bakir, a plane maker, about the new plans for Baby Concorde. Small planes, which will beat the sound barrier without disturbing the environment by creating sonic booms. Mr. Bakir, Concorde, the first plane to beat the speed of sound, is well known for being one of the world's dirtiest and noisiest aircraft. How do you plan to change that for the better? There are plans already for the new plane. We could begin building the new design within five years. Do you know the new Baby Concorde will be faster and, of course, much cleaner and quieter? There are lots of advantages to the new design, then. Oh yes, journey times will be much shorter. Rome to London, for example, might only take one hour. 
Of course, at the moment, Concorde is not allowed to fly at supersonic speed over land as it makes too much noise. The sonic boom, the noise it makes when flying at that speed, disturbs residents who live in the flight path and can shatter glass and shake buildings. At the moment, it only really flies at that speed over oceans. If it could maintain that speed over land, as the new designs will, then it would cut journey times considerably. More than 60% of current air traffic flies over land, so for supersonic transport to become important, its noise level has to be reduced. And of course, the emissions of the current models pollute the atmosphere a lot, so that has to be modified too. So how are you planning to do this? Experts believe that they can produce a new generation of supersonic aircraft which are quiet enough to fly over land without anyone on the ground being disturbed. The nose and the tail sections of the aircraft will be extended. This will flatten the pressure waves, which are created when a plane passes the sound barrier, thus reducing the boom. NASA have already managed to reduce the noise level on experimental designs to a quarter of that currently produced by today's supersonic aircraft. They hope to cut this even more with time and testing. Also, the new engines being trialled only emit a quarter of the amount of nitrogen oxide currently emitted. How far will these new aircraft be able to fly? They will have a range of about 11,000 miles. That is more than twice the distance our aircraft today are able to fly. The target launch date is about 2020. If you want to keep up to date with developments, then visit our website www.supersonic.com. Mr. Bachir, many thanks. Now you will hear the interview again. Today I am talking to John Bachir, a plane maker, about the new plans for Baby Concorde, small planes which will beat the sound barrier without disturbing the environment by creating sonic booms. Mr. Bachir, Concorde, the first plane to beat the speed of sound, is well known for being one of the world's dirtiest and noisiest aircraft. How do you plan to change that for the better? There are plans already for the new plane. We could begin building the new design within five years. Do you know the new Baby Concorde will be faster and, of course, much cleaner and quieter? There are lots of advantages to the new design, then. Oh, yes. Journey times will be much shorter. Rome to London, for example, might only take one hour. Of course, at the moment, Concorde is not allowed to fly at supersonic speed over land as it makes too much noise. The sonic boom, the noise it makes when flying at that speed, disturbs residents who live in the flight path and can shatter glass and shake buildings. At the moment, it only really flies at that speed over oceans. If it could maintain that speed over land, as the new designs will, then it would cut journey times considerably. More than 60% of current air traffic flies over land, so for supersonic transport to become important, its noise level has to be reduced. And, of course, the emissions of the current models pollute the atmosphere a lot, so that has to be modified too. So how are you planning to do this? Experts believe that they can produce a new generation of supersonic aircraft which are quiet enough to fly over land without anyone on the ground being disturbed. The nose and the tail sections of the aircraft will be extended. This will flatten the pressure waves, which are created when a plane passes the sound barrier, thus reducing the boom. NASA have already managed to reduce the noise level on experimental designs to a quarter of that currently produced by today's supersonic aircraft. They hope to cut this even more with time and testing. Also, the new engines being trialled only emit a quarter of the amount of nitrogen oxide currently emitted. How far will these new aircraft be able to fly? They will have a range of about 11,000 miles. That is more than twice the distance our aircraft today are able to fly. The target launch date is about 2020. If you want to keep up to date with developments, 
then visit our website www.supersonic.com. Mr. Bachir, many thanks. That is the end of part three and of the test. In a moment, your teacher will stop the tape and collect your papers. Please check that you have written your name, centre number, and candidate number on the front of your question paper. Remember, you must not talk until all the papers have been collected. Teacher, the tape should now be stopped and all the papers collected. Thank you, everyone. That is the end of part three and of the test. In a moment, your teacher will stop the tape and collect your papers. Please check that you have written your name, centre number and candidate number on the front of your question paper. Remember, you must not talk until all the papers have been collected. Teacher, the tape should now be stopped and all the papers collected. Thank you, everyone.